Welcome to the Inferno Cast. Today's guest is a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. He has also fought in Pride, Shuto, and the UFC, and is known to be one of the pioneers of mixed martial arts, Mr. Ensign Inouye. How are you doing today, sir? Good, man, good. I really appreciate you taking time to talk to me. Um, I hope you guys are doing okay, you know, holding up over in Japan. I know you've been trying to stay busy, especially with the pups and the dogs entertaining us all over the world with the pictures. We've been loving them. <laughs> right on. Um, so I wanted to start with kind of how you found martial arts. Uh, when you were a kid, you know, was it movies, comic books, you know, was it family? Like, what inspired you to get into martial arts? Um, actually, uh, I didn't really like martial arts when I first started. It was, uh, <clears throat> I, my first experience with martial arts was really bad. Yeah. Um, I, I took, I, I think I was about five or six, I think, and I was doing karate. And I still remember the teacher's name. His name was Daryl Lee. And uh, we were just, it was, I think it was like the, like the first or second class that I took. And we we're in a, like a little stance. And then he was just coming around, just checking everyone's legs, like a, like a little sweep to see if we we're standing good. And I guess right. for some reason, my, my base wasn't good. And when he kicked me, I fell. And I, I don't know why, but I don't know if it was the insecurity of doing something new, but um, I just didn't like it and got up, started crying, got up and ran out of the gym. And I went downstairs because the class was to be for an hour. And because it, it was in like the first five minutes, I had to call my parents to come pick me up early. Yeah. And it was, it was where I was, I was so small. I remember that I couldn't reach the payphone. Oh, wow. And I didn't, couldn't reach the payphone. And I didn't have money because it was a sudden thing that I just wanted to go home. Yeah. So I went and, uh, went to a construction worker. I remember a construction worker was walking, working on the street. I asked him for money. And then I asked him to dial my phone number for me and pass oh. me the phone. Wow. Yeah. So I remember um, having my dad pick me up. And the ironic thing about that is, you know, if you have a child and something like that happens, you want you, my, my best, what I think would be the best thing for the child is to make them go back, you know, and not be right. a quitter and not, especially not quit like that, you know, cry and leave. But yeah. I, I don't, I remember my father, I don't remember my father saying anything like that. No pressure. I told him I don't ever want to go karate again. It was kind of like, okay, good. No more martial arts for you. And it was a, it was a real awkward thing because my whole family, my grandfather was a black belt in karate. My mother was a brown belt at the time. Egan was a brown belt at the time. So everybody was um, into the martial arts. And mm, I don't know, it, it was good. Cause then after that, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to do any martial arts again. I, Martial arts wasn't even on my radar. And what brought me back to it was when we're, as we're getting older, you know, you know, in Hawaii back in the day, it's, everything's about a street fight. Right. So you get into I've a little. Heard that uh, a, I've fight. heard that a lot um, from people from Hawaii. They're like, man, Hawaiians, like they are fighters. Like that's what it's about. Yeah. I mean, like everything, you know, if you verbally, if you verbally couldn't sell it, giving mediocre effort, it was like, let's go outside. And it was pretty much settled there. There was no knives. Oh, there, there were knives, but there were no guns. There was no lawsuits or anything. So so, the, so what happened was it came to a point where I realized that I had to learn to fight to defend myself. I had to learn to fight to um, be able to defend myself and if I was with a girlfriend and defend her if something happened, altercation happened. So I started taking um, fighting, and that's actually what got me into the martial arts, not in the ring. So from there, I wanted to, you know, of course you want to find a, um, a legitimate martial art, one that actually is applicable on the street. And I, you know, I tried, you know, karate, I did, but I never did go back to karate. I went, from there, I went to like Taekwondo and Hapkido, and I really like Taekwondo Hapkido, but I wasn't flexible. So I wasn't like the best candidate to be a Taekwondo fighter because I wasn't flexible at all. Working on my stretching every day, never could get it. And so I continued with Taekwondo. And then I found uh, like Wing Chun, Jaekwondo and Wing Chun. And I thought that was really good because Taekwondo I thought was distance. And then yeah. Wing Chun got into a, a close distance where you had contact and you could use your hands using contact. And I thought, okay, that's a good art too. And then I then. Went to university and I got um, Aikido. 
And Aikido was really funny because when I started Aikido, um, of course, I'm looking for something that could be applicable tomorrow, you know. And, well, of course, if not tomorrow, maybe at least in a month. And when I was doing Aikido, I noticed it was really difficult. My, my opponent pretty much had to flow with me. And so I went up to the teacher and I asked him, that, you know, Aikido is really hard to, if I get attacked, what happens? Because the opponent won't flow with me. He goes, well, that's where it's your job to harmonize with his energy. So when he pushes, you pull. When he pulls, you push. And I'm like, whoa. So to harmonize with the energy, harmonizing meaning being on tune with everything he's doing. And I was thinking like, wow, you're fighting someone in the street. How are you going to know, be able to harmonize? And he's, you know, you got to just practice. And he said, some masters are able to defend themselves after 60 years of training. I'm like, 60 years? I'm, I'm thinking, well, when I'm 70 years old, I hope I'm not having to fight in the street. You know, so see, this is not something I want. So I also, you know, realized that you, you fight, oops, sorry. Okay. You fight an attacker. If you fight an attacker, you're fighting a, an attacker that um, is going to come at you at different energy every single time. Yeah. So I, you know, for me, I, I mean, Aikido wasn't was out. And the one more thing that pretty much sealed the deal for me is, he told me, well, the the victory is not fighting. And I was like, I wasn't into that mental state, the spiritual state of martial arts at the time. It was all physical, practical martial arts. So right there, I was like, you know, this shit isn't for me, man. Because on the street, we have to fight. And I was a real punchy kid, so. I would get into a lot of fights. I'm like, no, turning, the, for me, back in the day when you're not mentally um, mature, you're like, walking away from a fight is like losing the fight. It's humiliating right. to to turn down a fight and walk away from a fight. So I was like, that's not for me. I don't care if I can be the victory in the in the in my teacher's eyes. Everyone else and to myself, I felt like I was a pussy and walked away and I was a wimp. Yeah. So Aikido's out the window. And then I found Muay Thai. I love Muay Thai. So Muay Thai was really good. There was a there was a Thai guy teaching in a park for free, oh, man, and weird. I went to that for a while. And then, yeah, so it was it was good. It was everything was good. And, and you know, to back in the day, you know, street fighting was punching and kicking, right? And so you know, I kept training that. Yeah, and then I kept training that, and I thought, okay, I'm ready for a street fight. And then I. Well, I remember I went to college and I was walking through the campus and I remember seeing a guy playing a video. And I was like, whoa, what is that? Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. And I'm like, what the hell is that? Watson knows Gracie Jiu-Jitsu in action one. And that's where they had all the Gracie fighters fight karate, fight taekwondo, fight all the different martial arts. I remember watching that and saying, wow, this is not the fighting that I thought of. I mean, they go into the ground and they they mount punch the guy on the ground. They like choked him out. And I'm like, whoa, this is intriguing. And then I remember seeing the last fight, Hicks and Zulu, and thinking, wow, this crazy family's gonna, there's no way this guy's gonna beat Zulu. Zulu was so much bigger and he was a notorious street fighter. So when I was watching that, I was saying, there's no way I was standing there. I was like, okay, this crazy guy actually does beat Zulu. I was like, this is something to learn. And sure enough, Hicks and got two Zulus back and choked him out. So right there, I was like, holy shit, this I got to do. Got fanatical. I mean, I got to a point where I was, I'm, I'm going to go tomorrow. Went down to the class, signed up for it. It was a non-credit course in the University of Hawaii. And signed up for it. And the first class I went to in the, in the system in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, they teach you self-defense before actual grappling. So we were standing there. Okay, guy holds you in the neck. You bend forward and do this. You guy holds you here. You swing your arm around and do that. And it was all this real... Um, unpractical stuff. Yeah, stuff that, oh, the guy got to leave his arm there for you to wrap it around. Right. So I'm like, this is not what I saw in the video. So after class was done and everyone was leaving, I went up to the teacher, Helson, and I said, you know, I want to I want to experience stuff that I saw in the video. And of course, you know, it's a university class. You can't pummel the student. So he said, okay, right. let's do it with no thing. Let's just wrestle and do what you want, gain positions. I'm like, okay, let's do that. I said, I looked, he called this Brazilian guy, Homero, out, and he was like 140. And I was like, I think I was like 180, maybe. I was like, shit, this tiny guy, Brazilian guy. I'm like, oh, shut up. Okay, cool. So we started grappling, and, and when we got, once he took me to the ground, he, I, felt, I felt helpless. I felt, 
I didn't know the dangerous position, so I didn't know whether I was turning into danger or not. And right. I, I remember him getting to my back and choking me out. And it, 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 the choke, you know, you, you, you don't need to understand the choke. When it, they put it on you, you can't scream your name. You can't say help. You can't say anything. It's, it's cinched in. It's tight. So I'm like, whoa, that was super uncomfortable. I see him, but there's, there's something must have went wrong. This guy is so small. There's no way he's going to beat me. So I said, okay, let's do it again. Three times, three times, same thing. And I think because I didn't understand um, joint locks, they didn't put a joint lock on me. They just went and choked me every time. So yeah. I realized he was actually choosing a way to finish me. That's how much control he had over me. And right there, I was sold. So going back to your question, that's the reason, that's what actually got me started, the martial arts, is yeah. learning to defend myself. And when I found Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, that was, lo and behold, the best martial arts I've ever tried. And I actually went to a point where I was still doing, you know, Wing Chun and you're doing both Muay Thai to a point where I got so fanatical in Jiu-Jitsu that I just stopped everything and just did Jiu-Jitsu. Really? So you just kind of dropped everything else, you know, the wayside as far as the striking and everything. Did, did you do it because you, you loved Jiu-Jitsu so much or was it because Jiu-Jitsu was just so stimulating and complex? Well, just, I did it because Jiu-Jitsu was so practical. Yeah. And then as anybody that's been on the mats knows, you get the jiu-jitsu bug after a certain while. That all you want to do is jiu-jitsu. All you can think of is jiu-jitsu. And all you're yeah. trying to do is figure out how to get out of different positions. So, you know, after, you know, wanting to do it for practical reasons, um, I, I, you know, I, it's, it's hard to say I fell in love with jiu-jitsu because it's almost to a, a – a point where it's not a choice or it's not a feeling it's a bug that bites you and that's all you want to do like something happens and, and god comes and re rewires your head to want to just do jiu-jitsu and yeah. that's that's where I, you know jiu-jitsu was my whole thing so how After long that, did you how long did you keep training with the gracies in hawaii like i mean did that continue were you doing extra classes were you putting in more time with them than just the regular college classes what was your schedule yeah, the, college, the college classes was tuesday thursdays and um, I real I, I do, as the people were getting better, I heard that Helston was having, I was still a white belt, but he was having classes for the blue and purple belts, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday in his garage. So I asked him if I could come. He he saw how he he liked me a lot because I was advancing really fast, and he saw that I guess that that hunger in me. So he said, "Yeah, come down." So I was doing the the Tuesday Thursday classes. I was doing Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday. And I could still couldn't get enough. So on the weekends when he had no classes, I would I talked to some of the I remember Lawson, James Tanaka, my cousin Gary, you know, I get all these guys that I called, oh this guy coffee, they're all black belts now. But um I called them together and said, Hey, this I'm gonna rent out the studio because I'm a college student, I can rent out the studio, let's get the studio for an hour and let's train. So we get together on Saturdays and train. So pretty much it went as um, Sundays was the only day I couldn't, and I was watching videos. Watch, you know, I would go to Helson's house. I was always at Helson's house because they had all these street fight videos that they wouldn't let people see. You uh -huh. know, there was one with Hoyler fighting um, this uh, Luther Lever guy, and they were they had the Hickson Beach fight with um, yeah. Ugo Dorte, and and we get to see all those because we got to we always go to Helsons and watch all these tapes, man. It was like numerous amount of tapes of jujitsu fighting other arts. And, you know, that's what I spent my Sundays on. So it was, I was pretty much jujitsu day in and day out. Yeah. So I trained that for the, what, what really got me really stuck on is after three months of jujitsu, um, I was still, you know, I was a racquetball player doing jujitsu and yeah. me and Egan went to uh, play in a, a racquetball tournament in Seattle and it was uh, a national tournament and we went there and after one of our games we went we we're going to go out to the clubs you know look for girls whatever you know we went in the car with one of my friends this guy Guy Humphrey he was a he's like a he's like a really good racquetball player but you know racquetball players are real skinny they're not real built yeah so they're really skinny we're also skinnier too back in the day but he was real skinny he, he's the one who got the car so we we're jumping in his car he was driving and we we're dr driving down downtown Seattle and remember stopping at a traffic light we're in the middle lane and there was a girls in the left lane so we kind of screamed out to them where are you guys going and they said oh we're going to a club follow us so we said okay we'll follow them they took a left turn 
So we went and said, shit, we got to follow him. So we, from the middle lane, we took a left turn. And from the left lane behind the girls, a car that came up far behind the girls was kind of going really fast. He ran and slammed right into the side of our car. Oh, so no. we, yeah, so he got into a car accident and they were like, oh, damn, like everything shifts from going to a club to now taking care of this problem. So we're thinking, oh, damn, what are we going to do? And then we, what, makes, what makes it even worse is there's a, there's a big uh, uh, a black guy comes out and he's pissed off. He's totally pissed off. His eyes are round. He's huge, too. He's like, you know the football players? You can kind of like feel like you can yeah. put a Coke on their traps. Yeah, but this guy comes out super angry. And he goes, of course, at the driver. So he's me and Egan. It's me, Egan, and Guy. And me and Egan are standing there pretty much like, holy shit. And he goes straight to Guy. And he's like pushing his finger on Guy's chest saying, what the fuck were you doing? We're going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. I remember saying that. I'm going to kill you now. And right there, we're like, okay, wait, let's go check who was wrong on this whole thing. So we're all walking up the street. This guy's aggressing guy. So Egan and I walk ahead and look up the street. And remember, I remember seeing like, okay, so his left lane, you could go straight and turn. And our lane is supposed to only go straight. So we're totally wrong. So I'm like, oh, shit. So we're like, and this guy's aggressing um, guy. And I was in this really awkward position because a lot, like an hour before that in the hotel room, I was the only one doing jiu-jitsu. Egan wasn't doing it yet. And Guy had no idea what it was. And I was like telling them, you know, putting them in like, tell, okay, get out of the mount. And I hold him in mount. They grab the, I said, you take the mount. And I, you know, that basic, you grab the arm and you turn them over. And I get out of the mount, you know. I'm telling him, I'm explaining to him that, you know, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu is this art that, you know, how Gracie sold it. Yeah, you don't need to be strong. It's leverage. You know, it doesn't matter how strong the guy is. It doesn't matter how big the guy is, you know. Total You're selling him on seven. how awesome and it I, is and you can beat leader, anybody. Yeah, you're pretty much telling them that if you know jiu-jitsu, you can be no matter what the size is. And I got this big, huge guy pissed off in front of me, attacking one of my good friends. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, it's going to be shitty to have that guy on me, but it's going to be even shittier to look like a total bullshitter. <laughs> so I'm okay, I'm going to take the, the, the medium road and I'm going to go and say something, but be nice about it. And hopefully that guy doesn't turn to me. So I go up and I say, hey, 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 you know what? Egan went to run and call the police at the payphone, the nearest payphone. He saw a payphone across. He ran running to the street to call the payphone. And I went up to confront that guy. And I kind of stepped between him and the guy. And I said, hey, hey, you know what? You know, cool down, man. The cops are coming. Let's wait for the cops to go. And I said it as nice as I could without sounding like a fag. Because I had my face to keep with my friend. Yeah. So I was like, cool down, man. The cops are coming. Let's wait for them. And he looked at me, and his eyes and his energy just transferred straight to me. Like, who the fuck are you? And started pushing my chest. I'm like, oh, fuck. And right there, I'm thinking, holy shit. What am I going to do? I mean, I'm thinking, what am I going to do? This guy's on me now. So I'm like, okay, step back. I stepped out of his reach. I said, hey, we don't want any problems. Let's wait for the police to come. And he stepped up again and started pushing my chest. And I was like, damn, if we get into a fight, I cannot let this guy get the first hit. Yeah. He's so big and I can't have him initiate it. So I'm thinking, okay, jiu-jitsu, I got to take him to the ground. So I thought to myself, if he touches me again, I'm going to take the initiative. I stepped back again and he came up to touch me again. As soon as he was about to touch me, I grabbed him in like a, a head and arm and just yeah. kind of spun and flipped, flipped him to the ground. We got to the ground. I don't, you know, it was, so, it was happening so fast that I got onto the mount. I don't know how. And I remember him, I remember looking down at him and he was like really pissed yet. So I hit him like three times, which didn't do anything to him. He just got more mad, reached up for my shirt and started to throw me off his mount from, with my shirt. And I remember my shirt ripping. My shirt actually ripped. Yeah. And then he turned his back, put my hooks in. I put the choke in. When I put the choke in, he started, he jumped up and he started, it was, I was on his back and he started kicking with his legs like that to a point where I went all the way to the halfway um, quarter of the street. 
Mm-hmm. But I sunk in the choke. And I remember, man, I remember holding the choke thinking, I've never choked anyone. It was only three months in class, jiu-jitsu class. Yeah. And I never choked anyone out. So I'm like, shit. They said that three seconds, this guy should pass out. I'm like, it feels like it's been a minute I've been choking them. And I hold the choke. And I remember thinking, right when I was saying, shit, I, I wonder if this choke actually works. The guy went limp and started twitching. He started twitching. So at that point, I was like, oh, he's asleep. We gotta go. And I remember Egan coming, running. He, he, heard, he said he heard a thud when I flipped him. <laughs> and so he came running across the street and he, I had him in the choke. And then Egan was screaming, kill him, kill him. Don't let him go, don't let him go. And I remember holding him, knowing that, oh shit, he's out. And then Egan screaming that at me, saying, oh shit. And so I, I, left, I must have held it another three, four, five seconds. And I remember this guy was so big after I let him off, I couldn't get up. So I had to like, like kick him off with my, with my other leg to get him up. We got up, jumped in the car and took off. And right there, man, I was sold. And that's what got Egan into jiu-jitsu. Oh man, I bet those guys were <laughs> yeah. just like, you, you know, you, you are the example of like the untouchable guy. Like you're able to stop this monster. So yeah, I'm sure that they immediately were paying attention to what you're telling them earlier that night about like, dude, jujitsu is the answer. <laughs> That's so funny. Well, yeah, yeah, no, it was, it was straight up. Like I, I walked the walk, you know, and yeah, they, they were so, Egan was sold in jujitsu. Egan was a, Egan was one of the top racquetball players in the world. So he couldn't, he, he started coming to jujitsu class and then he guys, you know, guys are not in control and they're trying to, there's a little ego sometimes in class where they want, they got a lock. They want to finish it. So he yeah. actually strained his arm once and affected his career. So from then on, we that's what I actually brought up Egan's school, Grappling Unlimited. We started training in his garage on the side. So whenever I would go to classes and everything, but on the side, I would meet Egan in our garage and we would just roll in our garage and I would teach him in our garage. Yeah. And that's what that's how great uh, Egan's gym started up. Is we've had more friends coming, more friends coming to a point where Egan was like, shit, I'm going to make the gym, you know? Yeah. So do you feel like you guys coming out, uh, you guys coming up as athletes, you know, with racquetball, I mean, because, I mean, you guys were serious contenders playing at a high level. Do you feel like that translated into the martial arts training as far as how you approach the training? Um, well, for me, I don't think so because um, I wasn't very disciplined in my training in racquetball. Egan was super disciplined, like early in the morning, don't even – Egan's the reason why I never drank or smoked alcohol. I mean, never smoked smoked marijuana or cigarettes or drank alcohol because he never did. So I kind of looked up to him, so I followed him. But Egan was really on it. Um, Jiu-jitsu, if anything, all the sports I played helped me with the the fact that I was more agile and I I understood my body movements a little more than someone that never did any sports. But as far as discipline-wise, um, I never really had discipline. And the reason why I had so good discipline in jiu-jitsu is because I loved it. I love racquetball, but I don't know, for something about, you know, as a, as a male, as a man, something about, you know, beating someone in a racquetball game and subduing someone physically, there's something way more attractive about, you know, that, that combat hand-to-hand subduing another man. Yeah. No, I understand, uh, you know, just being able to, like, have the confidence that you know you can protect yourself. You know, or the, yeah. or even the confidence just to know you don't have to be afraid. You know, like you don't have to be yeah. afraid of altercation. Because well, even today, even today, man. You know, you know when you when I walk around and there's like if I, me and my girl walking down the street and there's a guy coming up the street in a dark alley, and you're thinking like, oh shit, I wonder who this guy is. I mean, aside from having a knife or a gun, I'm not that worried about it. I can walk down the street and not be too too scared, but of course there's that fear of a, a weapon, you know, and it, and and of course there's a little insecurity there. And I was I always used to I always think even today I think oh I'm so happy that I'm in this position where I feel confident of defending myself hand to hand combat almost with every anyone in the world I can hold my own at, at least enough to get let my girl get away or you know. Yeah. And I always thought to myself, man, man, can you imagine how girls feel or how guys has never trained martial arts feel that the the level of insecurity walking down that street, going off across this guy, the level of different situations that'll create anxiety and fear in you. It must be like, 
really uncomfortable. So, you know, be, being able to defend yourself and being in the position I am, I mean, it's, it's overall well-being for myself, virtually and mentally. So you're in Hawaii, you're training, you're obsessed with jiu-jitsu. How did you end up in Japan and, and, your career, and your career get started? I mean, that seems like a pretty big jump. How did that happen? Well, I used to watch a lot of fighting. I used to love boxing. And for me at that moment, being in the ring was a whole different life. It wasn't something that was in my lifeline. I trained martial arts, I fought martial arts, but in no way did I consider myself a professional to be able to fight other professionals in the ring. You know, street fights are easy. Every time you get into a street fight, it's you're angry. You're angry because you get into a street fight. And right. anger will get you, you – there's no nerves. You, there's, you don't have any anxiety. You're not afraid at the moment because when it happens, it happens like that. So there's, there's no um, preparation. This guy doesn't know who you are. You know. Yeah. Most of the time, because I never drank, the guy was drunk. So, you know, for 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 me, it was, you know, a whole different level if you're going to go into a ring with someone who's been training, like his job, eight hours a day to fight, learn to the techniques of hurting someone and not being hurt by someone. Right. And then on top of that, the guy knows who he's fighting and he's training specifically to hurt you. Mm -hmm. On top of that, there's going to be thousands of people watching, possibly a VHS tape that will last almost forever, that if right. you really get your ass kit, it's going to be on forever. Yeah. And, it's, it, you know, the, for me, that was just a whole different level of fighting. So I was just training for the streets. Mm -hmm. And what happened with me, the, the interesting thing is, you know, a lot of the fighters today – they're fight fans. They start training because they want to learn to fight, and then they feel like they can be good. And in this day and age, the money is getting better in the fight, the sport. So you can get rich, you can get famous, you can make a living, you can get sponsors. You know, you can eventually open up your own gym that could make money. You know, so there's a there's a future in the sport. Yeah. Um, back in my day, well, there was no future. So for us, it wasn't about it was there was no intrigue on getting to the ring to to make money. So uh, for me, especially, it was. I had no, I had no, I, my head, didn't have my eyes on the belt. I didn't have my eyes on, on, on winning and being famous because you couldn't, couldn't yeah. get rich. Didn't exist. My whole thing was, yeah, so I, I had no interest in getting into the ring. The only thing that got me into the ring was, um, I remember when I was little, I saw a movie of a car, a family driving down the street and a car kind of rolling over and they, the car caught on fire. And then the, when a car caught on fire, I remember the guy got out and he he couldn't open the car door because he was in panic. And he was uh, so his anxiety and fear and everything, the emotions took control of him were something that he can do with his eyes closed. He couldn't even open it. His family actually burned and died. I don't even know what it was. It was some kind of documentary, a reenactment documentary of yeah. the situation. And I remember saying, I, I couldn't live with myself if I, I, couldn't control, I couldn't save my family. So I remember thinking, like, I always, always related it to my racquetball games. When I played racquetball, I remember going to the court for practice, getting good, working on a new serve and getting the serve in really good. And then when it's time for the tournament, when there's pressure on and the, the, the crowd's watching, you, you, you're, you're playing against an opponent that's trying to beat you. Somehow that serve that you could hit nine out of ten times you hit it like the way you could hit it in practice like one out of ten times sometimes even when you're moving for a ball your footwork is all you know you you step and lunge for and hit the ball but my footwork was all off i mean i felt like this isn't my feet and i realized that the only time that happens is when i'm nervous when i'm at a tournament when i'm in a glass court when I'm, there's spectators watching and i realized that that's my emotions taking control of me. And I related that in a very, um, in a lower level to that guy in the, the car accident. I'm thinking to myself, if I can't control my, my emotions in a racquetball tournament, I'm not going to be able to control my emotions if I have a life in that situation or I've got to save my family. I say, okay, i got to work on that. And I, and I knew that that was not any comparison to saving my family in a, in a burning car, but I knew it was a step closer to being able to do that 
And I knew that the ensign that would control his anxiety and emotions in the racquetball court could possibly save his family better than the ensign that couldn't control his emotions in the racquetball court. So my whole thing was about being able to be practice ensign and tournament ensign. You know, I mean, yeah. anyone who's done any competition or any type of speech in, in public speaking knows what I'm talking about. You know, even public speaking, something that more people can relate to. You go and practice a speech that you're going to give in front of the class a hundred times and you can do it in front of your parents. As soon as you get into class, because you're nervous, the teacher's watching, she's going to grade you. All of a sudden, you know, stuff you memorize and you had doesn't come out as smooth as it used to when you practice it. So... For me, I felt, man, that's the way to do it. To, to sports was a good way that I could actually learn to control myself, my emotions. Mm -hmm. And in racquetball, my racquetball career, I never got as good as Egan. I never got to a point where I could control myself 100%, but I got to a comfortable point that I almost felt like it was fair to say that the, this guy beat me because he was better than me, not because I was nervous. Mm -hmm. Not because I didn't play well because of my nerves. So I, I, I felt I could control it pretty good in racquetball already. And I started Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, and I got really close with the Gracie family. You know, Helson was like a brother. I would meet up with Hoist a lot, because Hoist would come and train it. Um, I'm come to visit Hoy. They love surfing, yes, and they come to surf. Hoist and Hickson, I remember. Hoyler, very little, but more Hoist and Hickson would come over a lot. And every time they would come over, I was so fanatical in Jiu-Jitsu, and I was like, you know, helping Helson with, with the seminars, because he, he didn't speak very good English at the time. So I was really close with the family. I would be there. He, Kelsen would cook for me. We'd eat. The, I, I remember this Brazilian uh, pudding that he used to make was so good. But, you know, we used to cook and everything. And the Hickson would come over. And they became, like, part of my family, my jiu-jitsu family, where I, I felt that they were like brothers. So when Hickson fought in the 1994 um, Volley Tudo Japan, I went. And, and I was so close to them. Hickson got me a couple of tickets to bring me and a friend. So we, we went up and watched and got tickets from Hickson. And I went and watched it. And, you know, being, uh, you know, my way of cheering, I'm not the boisterous type. I, I would not scream out and I just sit down. And, you know, if my friend wins, he'd be like, yeah, you know, real quietly, just sort of real quietly cheering for my friend inside. And then I remember when Hickson, he fought David Becky, which is David was huge. Yeah. And I remember him beating David and to a point where I remember jumping up on the seat and screaming. And I, and, and after I did it, I caught myself like, holy shit, this is unlike my character. And I like, kind of kind of got a little shame and sat down and I was like, holy shit. And then I was like, oh, so excited. I couldn't control myself. And that just took my mind to think that, holy crap, if I can't control myself watching a friend fight in the ring, what if it was me? And I was saying, okay, I got to experience that once. Whether I could control it in one fight or not, just to experience it would better me for the real situation, I thought. So I thought, mm -hmm. I'm not a fighter. The ring isn't something for me. So I'm going to try and just get in there once just to see what it's like. I mean, I'm not even thinking pros. I'm thinking amateurs. Yeah. So I'm thinking, okay, Japan's had a lot of fighting. You know, in Hawaii, you know, they'd have this guy, Dennis Alexio, fight a lot. But even when he fought, it was once every year or twice every year if we're lucky so there's hardly any fights in hawaii so getting into the ring isn't even a fantasy but in japan every weekend they had fights all over the place so i figured my thing is i'm going to call these associations see if i can get in i believe my gracie jesus was good enough that i can get by my striking was horrible but i figured my gracie jesus is good enough so i called associations, I called UWF, I called Rings, I called Pancras, I called as much as I, I mean, I looked at videos and I said, okay, um, New Japan, oh, that's totally pro wrestling, screw that. UWF, I was like, damn, that, they do arm bars, they do chokes, I'm like, shit, that looks real. So I called UWF and then this the lady answered and she said, oh, how old are you, how tall are you? And I'm like, why is she asking me my weight and height and age? And she said, oh, well, if you're this age and that, and you can't come and I'm like I think I was under the um I think the age age I was over the age they wanted younger guys so I'm like oh this is weird so I'm like screw that please called rings and called uh pancreas and they told me that I need to send in a resume with a picture of full body and half body um waist up and send in a resume of what I did and who I am 
So I did that. And I signed out, took pictures, sent them all in to Pankers. And they said, okay, you got to wait for, a, we're going to call you. We're going we're to wait for, an, they call it a shin deshi. So it's a new boy test, new student test. Yeah. So they're going to, they run them through a test and make them do physical stuff, sparring. And then they um, take you in the dojo as a trainee. So I'm like, okay, shit, I got to wait for it. But I'm excited to just get in the ring already. So I remember Shuto. Shuto was, I remember the fighter Kawaguchi that fought in Shuto. Uh, and and they, they, had the, they had ground, they had foot locks, they had arm locks, everything. So I'm like, okay, that place. And if I, you know, if I can't fight in the ring there, at least I can be a training. I, mean, I can, My way in is to say, I got crazy jitsu. I can train with Kawaguchi and help him out. So I call the gym and they answer the gym and I say, you know, I, my name is Ensinino. I, I train a little Gracie Jiu Jitsu. I want to know if I can be a, a possible sparring partner for Kawaguchi. And they're like, oh, come down. I'm like, whoa, no Is resume, easy. no restriction, no age restriction, height restriction. Like, come down. I'm like, whoa. So I used to live up north in, in, in Fukushima. So I jumped on a train, jumped down, went down the next day and went into a gym and there was three guys in the room. And I, took, I walked in, said, hi, my name's Ensign. They said, oh, hi, nice to meet you. They're super nice. They all come. Walked into the gym. Had a couple guys, like, rolling on the mat. And I remember they're telling me, okay, hey, they called a kid over. They said, oh, let me see what your movement's like. Go spar with this guy. So I go and spar with this guy, and he's, like, 50 pounds lighter than me and knows no Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. So when we're on the ground, it's like I, I feel a little danger in his foot locks. But other than that, he understood no positioning. I got side control. It was an automatic mount. Yeah. Got mount. He had no idea how to get out of mount. Swinging his legs, trying to bring his legs over. And I'm like, wow, this guy's not that good. And we're done. After training, we did the training. We sat down. And I remember the, the, the founder of Shuto Sayama. He's, the, he's known as the first Tiger Mask. I remember him looking over at the kid and saying, we can use this guy. I'm thinking about that the Japanese he used sky must like sky konito sky must and they're like use me what does he mean and he looked at me he goes you want to fight pro I'm like whoa I said like, no no pro pro no, amateur I want to get I want to get in the ring I want to train with Kawaguchi or I want to just get a, get in the ring he goes no you can fight pro I'm like whoa are you serious he goes no, no trust me trust me you can fight oh. pro so I put my faith in in Sayama and said okay. I'll, I'll just believe what he says. I changed my whole. I was a, I was a top racquetball player in Japan at the time, yeah. and I just cold turkey and all of that. And every day, like I did Rishi Jitsu, every day I moved into the gym, lived in the. They had private rooms next to the gym, so I would. Li he got me a room. I lived in the gym, and every day train, every day train. Three months later, he said he wants me to make my pro debut, and as I'm training. That little kid that I sparred with, I remember seeing him in magazines. Like, oh shit, this guy's famous, you know. So he he, he was a middleweight champion. He was his name was Nakai Yuki. Yeah, so it was Mr. Nakai, you know. He, and I was like, oh shit, this guy's famous. And I just kind of manhandled the guy, yeah. with not not physically, but more techni technically. Right. And I remember Sayama saying, you know, you're ready, and started. I would show him a lot of Gracie movements like that as we're training. He teach me how to strike and tackle. We do all the, the drills, and um, I had my first fight. Got in the ring, and like I expected, man, I got too excited. I actually got tired mount punching somebody, oh, and I thought, okay, that was good. I, I, it wasn't the real me in the ring, but you know, I got that experience. I'm better at going to be a little better at controlling my anxiety in a, in a real situation, and I'm done. Okay, I'm done. All right, and Sayama comes to me and says, hey. Look what it did. And in those days, when you got the second fight of the night, you got a little black and white lettering on your name. He showed me a full color page of me. Like this, this is like the, um, this is this scary, this, this scary guy that comes out that knows Gracie Jiu Jitsu. And I think I got that article up in the, on my wall. I can show you, show that to you. It's awesome. Yeah, so they always get you with the like, hey, you did a good job. Look what it could be. You know, it's like, look at the poster. I mean, that's. Uh... Yeah, I mean, I got a full page color. You know, it was like, it was me monk punching somebody. 
Oh, that my opponent. Yeah. Oh, damn, I can't find it. Oh shit, I don't have it. Sorry, I don't have that picture of me mouth punching the guy. Oh, here it is. Okay, here. Can you see that? Oh yeah. So that's oh, a whole. That's a color picture of me, and it says shooting. This is they call me like a um a monster. <laughs> A, a Japanese monster that knows uh, the Gracie Jiu Jitsu movements. <laughs> and when I got that full color page, Sayama was excited saying, okay, next we want you to fight this and that. I'm like, oh, wait, 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 no, no, no. No more fighting for me. It was only one fight. And as I said that, I felt like a little obligation after yeah. him working with me and giving me that chance, you know, to get in the ring. So I felt a little obligation to do another fight. Right. And when I wanted to do another fight, and when I wanted to do another fight, to a point where the fourth fight, I beat a K1 fighter, Andre Manart. And it was, of course, he's a stand fighter, but I was a, you know, I took him to the ground, mount punched him. And something clicked in my head, like, oh, shit. As I'm getting more experience in controlling my emotions, shit, this is uh, something that I'm pretty good at. And maybe I can see, challenge myself into higher levels and see how good I can get. And to my whole career, my focus never, never swavered to money or a belt. My focus was always on putting myself in adverse situations, putting myself against someone that I think could break me yeah. and see how I can react to the situation, keep stay in control of my emotions and keep my heart strong when it never gets broken. So if you notice the fights that I chose was all fights like that. Yeah. And, and that's what I look at is like, so when you look at your career trajectory, you ended up in Japan because you're playing racquetball. You ended up staying because, you know, you love martial arts. You get, you get this opportunity to, to fight. The momentum continues. You're learning about Japanese culture. You know, before you know it, you're, you're there for a few years. You, you take a fight to test yourself, which that's the part that's really intriguing because your martial arts interest started because you wanted to – prepare yourself for, you know, for a self-defense, you know, it wasn't for the grandeur of, I want to be tougher than everybody and I want recognition. And then your first fight is about you wanting to test yourself and your emotions because you knew in that circumstance would be very difficult to keep your composure. And then your four or five fights later, and then you start seeing that this could be an opportunity to test yourself even more. You, you never looked at it as like, oh, I can be the guy, I can win the belt or the champion you were looking at it as this is another way for me to test myself, you know, physically, mentally, spiritually. And so that type of perspective on your career, you know, do you feel like that made you grow as a martial artist to put yourself in that position? Most definitely, because as a martial artist, that's the objective of a martial artist to better themselves, to become a better person, not be a rich person, not be a famous person. So, you know, it's ironic because I see fighters, you know, picking fights because they can beat the fighter. Yeah. I don't know if there's a fighter very rarely when you see a fighter say, I want to fight that guy because I think he can kick my ass and he can put me in a position of fear and anxiety and, and uncomfortableness that I might want to quit. You know, so it was a whole, it's a whole different, you know, I, like I say, you know, I heard someone say it, I forget who said it, but they said, the, the, the sport has from, gone from martial art to sport yes. to entertainment. Yes. You know? and, and those are the transitions. Like, I mean, even your own career, because there was the guys that laid the groundwork, you know, at the Gracie's and, you know, the old, you know, Ken Shamrock and, and Eric Paulson. Like, you know, there's guys back then that was like the battle of martial artists. Then there was that next generation where you guys took the mixed martial arts and you transitioned it into sport fighting because – you guys were getting better at all things. Like, like that was a big thing that I remember was, you know, watching Shuto and Pride and just seeing it wasn't so much stylistic anymore. Like, you guys were evolving. And then now, you know, like, it's really turned into the entertainment business, you know, to each their own. But I feel like that, that stage that you were in was one of the most important because it embodied the, it embodied the forever student. The first MMA fights, you know, cage fights back in the day was to prove which style was better. It was almost like impose your will. And mm -hmm. then it evolved into where you were at, where it was, I'm going to learn everything I can about all of this stuff 
to be a better martial artist. And like you said, there was no upside. There was no huge check, you know, win the title, become world famous. So it had to have been a path of passion. So how did all of those lessons of you going in that direction transfer into the rest of your life? Well, well, to go back on what you just said was really important. I wanted to mention was the fighters of my, my age were not only important for martial arts, but it was important for the sport itself. The sport would not be around if it wasn't for the pioneers. Absolutely. I mean, I'm a, I'm a level of a pioneer, but I believe there's other people that are more pioneers of me. So pioneers of the pioneers, yes. you know, Mark Coleman, Hoist Gracie, Ken Shamrock, you know, those guys are pioneer pioneers. Yeah. yeah. So if it wasn't for them, I can almost honestly say 90% of the fighters that fight today would not fight back in that day. Right. Not only because there was no fame and money, because it was not understood yet. And it was very it was unregulated. It was barbaric. It was barbaric. Yeah. It was human cockfighting. And most of the people that, a lot of the fighters that fight today would be like, fuck that. That's crazy. But yeah. now it's well, I mean, got rules, it's got weight classes, it's got time limits, yeah. you know, and it's more understood now. Back in the day, it was punching, just knocking this other guy out. And yeah. it was just pretty much going up and just going crazy, you know. And but now it's like there's a technique to it, there's a sport to it, there's a there's a regulation, there's you know you, you can't take steroids. You know, back our day, no rounds, no weight yeah. classes, no steroid. You can take steroids, you can take whatever you want, you could whatever you want to do, and the rules are really different. You know. Yeah, they were very. Uh, I always call them interpretive rules. Like you know, like there was rules, but it was like, eh, you didn't know if they're going to be enforced. In this, in this day and age, if you if you if you get one of the fighters, a regular um, UFC fighter, and tell them, okay, you're going to have to fight in these rules, most of them will say, "Fuck, I got to get paid more." Yeah, I need more money if I'm going to have to fight this guy that's way bigger than me. You know, they, if you miss a weight, you get twenty percent of your fighter's purse because you're fighting someone bigger. Yeah, you know. That was our thing. We had to fight people bigger. We had to fight them these crazy rules yeah. with way less pay than what they're getting paid now. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's yeah. a whole reversal. Yeah. So well, I mean, you guys were like the first step in like legitimizing as a sport because like when when the UFC kicked off, that was kind of like everybody started asking questions of like who can beat who within styles. Then that next generation, which was you guys, it started becoming the question who can grow the most as like a mixed martial arts athlete? Like who can learn more wrestling, learn more submissions, you know, fight consistently within rules. Like, like it started getting, it started getting reformed, but it was still really loose. It really set the framework for the entertainment part of mixed martial arts where people could follow fighters, you know, and they knew they were going to fight soon. And it wasn't this underground, you know, nobody knows about it. There's a VHS tape. You got to go buy from a friend. Like, it became mainstream because you guys were pushing your own limits to where, you know, it was a, it was a test for yourself and others to observe. But I do feel that you guys were walking into a lot more unknown in those days than what fighters yeah. walk into now. I mean, fighters now, like they're full time, like they get to train all day. They have the best coaches physically, the jujitsu, like their technical performance levels athletes is so much higher now. But like you said, they're, they're walking into a situation in which there's more known factors. Even though, like, that guy might hit harder nowadays, he's in my weight class. You know, he's – I've watched film on him. I know what to expect. The referee's going to enforce the rules. There's the judges that are going to enforce what's supposed to happen, where when you were fighting, it was very much like, well, I hope the ref does a good job today. <laughs> you know. Um, it's more like, I hope I can kill this guy before he kills me. Absolutely. I, I mean, and like the fights would go so much further then as well. Like, I mean, stoppages in the old days, man, they, they went on and on. Like, how did you cope with that? Well, I, you know, I, I, that's the only way I saw it. There was, there was no high, early stoppages were a realistic fight. You know, for us, if we, right now, nowadays you can compare it and say, oh, look, whoa, they didn't stop it back then. But back in the day, that was okay. That was the norm. It was like, yeah. The opposite. If they stopped the fight to the way they stopped it today back then, they'd be like, what the hell are you doing? The fight just started. You know, so like I always say, you know, the where the where the fight is stopped today is where the, the heart of the 
you know, where the heart of a fighter is beginning to be shown is where the fights are stopped today. Yeah. And well, I, I definitely, yeah, and you it's definitely like, had I, some wars back then. It's kind of, it's kind of, uh, uh, you know, win lose situation because I think I would have got a lot of fight bonuses. Yeah. I would have got more money. I would have had, I would have been a real popular fighter and, and probably got good pay for my fights and been richer and a lot of sponsors. But, on the other hand, I wouldn't be known as I am, you know, I, I, the Japanese press gave me the nickname Yamato Damashi, which is the samurai spirit, the yeah. never dying spirit. And the only reason why they could see that spirit in me is because they let fights continue back in the day. Yeah. And if I came, you know, of course the money and the, the fame is so flashy right now, but if I did come up in that day, they wouldn't allow fights to go as far as it did. And I wouldn't have been able to show. I would have been just some dude that came out like a pit bull and got knocked out or was tough. Yeah. I wouldn't have been able to show that bronze. So, um, so good and bad. Yeah. With you having the opportunity to have that part of you come out from those circumstances, how has that influenced the rest of your life? Um, for me, um one um i i give everything i got you know you know you know whenever you do any anything in life there's always that regret if you didn't try everything you didn't give everything you got i i feel like i've trained as hard as i could ever train i've experienced as much as i could in the ring i i went with the igor fight i i almost died so i almost fought i was almost able to fight to the death you know perforated eardrum, swollen brain, broken jaw, broken finger, and the liver count 2,000 times the normal person. My liver was about to shut down. You know, there's nothing more severe than that than except death, I think, in the ring. So I got, you know, I got all, I did all this. I have nothing, I don't watch any fights today wanting to get back in the ring. I'm done. I got it done. I, I feel like that, that gave me the, the, the feeling of, 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 you know, I'm serene, I'm complete, I'm, I'm happy with what I did in the ring. I got nothing else to do, nothing else to prove. I see the bare knuckles, a lot of guys coming out. I have no desire to do that. Yeah. I've trained as hard as I could. I've gave everything I got in the sport. And I know, you know, physical limitations and the, you know, the aspect that I was trying to learn about myself in the ring is over. Yeah, I you felt took that it to the limit. Over. Yeah, I took it to the limit. I don't think I have anything else to learn in the ring. And, you know, like a lot of these fighters, you know, like you see BJ Penn and a lot of these fighters still want to fight, yeah? It's because they're, 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 they're combat warriors, they're sportsmen. They're, they're, they haven't, didn't start with the, 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 the reason why I started. I started to test myself. Once that test is over and I feel like I can't learn anymore, I have no desire. They had the desire to scrap. You know, BJ wants to scrap. He's good. He wants to show that he still got it. I think BJ still does have it, you know. Yeah. But if I started with the desire, I think seeing fighting, I would even want to get back in the ring probably. But yeah. mine was my whole desire to fight was totally different. You know, it was about learning about myself as a man, you know, getting my self-esteem, becoming, believing in myself and knowing that I can, I can take – extreme punishment and still be focused and not give up and do not and keep that mindset so i think what that martial arts has done for me is it's given me a real serene place to be in my life right now and i can pursue hobbies now you know like my bracelets that i make yeah it's my hobby it's become a business because uh, people wanted to buy it and I'm, I'm pursuing that with a passion it's not about making money I mean, if I have a person that comes in and I'm lining up a bracelet for them, I mean, this has happened many times. And they come in and, you know, they're like, okay, we want this bracelet. Okay, line up a bracelet. And, you know, of course, you know that these stones are precious stones. Some of them are very hard to find. And the, the rare stones are real more expensive. So if they line up a stone and say, I line up a bracelet and say, okay, what's the retail? And they sell us $750. And, you know, they see their face like shit. Their face drops and they're like, Oh shit, my limit is 250. And I'm like, you know what? Fuck. I'm looking at that and thinking, okay, damn, 750, 250. I, I might be losing money on this. And I'm looking at that and, you know, I, it's a vibe, you know. Of course, you got people that's going to poo that bullshit to get a cheaper bracelet. 
Yeah. And, and I feel, I trust myself, I can see that vibe. But there's a couple, a couple instances, more numerous instances that happen where they line it up and they're like, shit, they can't afford it. So they, they start taking out the expensive stones and putting in cheaper ones just because the price. And I'm looking at saying, and saying you know, my reason for doing this is because I enjoy doing this. And a big reason why I enjoy it is because these stones have properties that we have a lot of testimonials that's been helping people, helping people with their anxiety, helping people with their diabetes. And I'm putting in these certain bracelets, I mean, these certain stones, not because they're expensive stones, but because they are stones that would be ideal in my idea to help them with their ailments or their, their theme of the bracelet. Yeah. And I see them picking out some of them because of the price. And I'm looking at, man, my objective is to help these people and to, you know, to, you know, to make something that makes someone happy. I'm yeah. sitting there looking at that thinking, man, it, what's, what's more important to me right now? Is it more important to make a pro, a big profit or is it more important to help this person? And of course, it's helping a person is much more important. And there's numerous times when, when they're like, there's, I told them, you know what, put the stones back in. And I said, so the stones they pull out, I put them back in. They look at me and said, no, I said, this is good. I said, you like this? I said, yeah. And I said, you know what? Whatever your, your budget was, that's fine. And they're like, whoa. And then I, 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 you know, instead of keeping that awkward situation, like, okay, what string color you want? No, okay, what, what strings do you want? There's an outside string, the inside, and go on with everything. And kind of, they're kind of like still like, whoa, what the fuck just happened? And, you know, that, that's happened before. There was another time where a, a, a young kid, like a 12-year-old kid, his parents had bracelets and they, they wouldn't buy him a bracelet because my bracelets aren't cheap. You go online, it's like it starts at 150. Yeah. And he saved up his money to make a bracelet. Line one up and it was over his budget. I knew his budget from the beginning, but I, the kids, I liked him. Okay, what stones do you like? And just let them pick their stones. He lined up like a four hundred dollar bracelet, and then and then he 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 started you know his budget. He, I think he saved up one hundred eighty dollars, and I didn't even tell him what the retail was. I just took the hundred eighty and and he got the bracelet he wanted. You know, so yeah. you know for me, I think martial arts in a way has allowed me to be that person now. You know, I'm not it's, I'm not ex about trying to make money. I'm about trying to help people. And, yeah, it's. I think that, you know, that that, I guess that serene or that that, the state of enlightenment or that I feel, I think I can, I feel that way now. It's almost like you found fulfillment because you've tested yourself, you pushed your personal limits, you know, you improved yourself as far as what you were able to accomplish, you know, in the ring and and just testing yourself in that circumstance and the residual effects are, you know, you're seeing what really is valuable to you in life, you know, which is helping people and connecting with people and, you know, these relationships you formed and um, just kind of being an, an energy for good, you know. Um, it's So if you were going to kind of talk to somebody that was maybe a younger fighter, they, they kind of want the career, but they are a martial artist, what advice would you give somebody in the modern day and age to help keep them grounded? Um, to keep them grounded, well, the one thing I always tell fighters nowadays is if you get injured, heal your injuries. The doctor tells you to stay out of training for two weeks, stay out of training for two weeks. Don't push it. I mean, you look, my fingers don't straighten, my fingers are crooked, my, my, I can't even put the praying sign unless I push my hands together. My hands are all crooked. My fingers are crooked. You know, my shoulder doesn't, my shoulder doesn't lift past this. Yeah, so even forward, you know, I can't lift my shoulders. My, my knee is bad. Um, heal your injuries. Don't rush into getting back into the ring. That's one of my big advice for uh, fighters, yeah. The second thing that I, I like to tell fighters that's really important is as you're going through all the experiences and training and learning discipline and, and you know, overcoming pain and, and fatigue in the ring, make sure that you transfer that into everyday life. I see a lot of fighters that, you know, have this great career and then they go out in the op open world and they just total fuck-ups, you know. Yeah. It's like... 
you got more discipline to that. You got a better head on your shoulders because those a good example is Dom Jones. He's he's like the best fighter in the world, and you don't just get that on talent. You there's a lot of discipline. There's a lot of you know motivation. There's a lot of you, you got to do shit right, yeah. and it's not an easy role to become that good of a fighter. And he can do that, but he can't stop himself from drinking alcohol and getting in his car. You know, I mean, it's something that you you think that is almost like an elementary thing that you before you get on the mat you bow. You know, it's like something something so don't drink and drive. That's like that's like saying don't. You know, someone's you got someone in the armbar. Don't don't go hard. Let them give them time to tap. Something simple as that, you know. And he's in the elite level of martial arts, but he's still in life. He's still learning the beginning stuff of life. Yeah. And well, I mean, I, I think there's love, a lot of there's a lot of fighters that end up in this industry because they struggle with everything else. You know, like like nothing else in life seems to work, and that's where your path is so unique. You know, because you came at it from such a different approach. But there's a lot of fighters that just end up being good at fighting but they struggle with the other stuff, you know? Um, well, you know, you know, that's true. But what I feel is that the, the, the crazy extreme stuff you go in training, if you had that person on the side relating, being able to relate that with everyday life, as you're growing in the ring, you're growing as a person. So I, my advice to fighters is to make sure you, the ring isn't just a ring. The ring is like your life. So what you learn in the ring, you apply to your life. You know, you go, you you're you're sore from yesterday's training. You don't want to get up and train, but you get yourself to get up and train. It's the same thing if your boss just chewed you out, and and the next day you got a lot of shitload of work, and you you know you just want to call in sick, and you don't. It's the same thing, man. Yeah. You know, you can push through adverse situations in training. You can push through adverse you you apply that same discipline, that same motivation to overcome adverse situations in life. If you can apply what you've learned and the, the stuff you've encountered and experienced in, in the ring, in training, in the gym, in life, it'll when you finish your life in in the ring, you walk out way ahead, man. And that's one thing I like to push with my students is that when they're going through adverse situations in, in training, I always relate that to life so that they can yeah. see the relations instead of just saying gym is a gym, life is life. So you're number one, a list in the gym, but you're failing on the in life. You know, you got it. If you can somehow connect it with your fighters, you can, you're improving them as people, you know? Yeah. And you know, I understand fighters. Now everything is the ring. I was willing to die in the ring, thinking that that's all there was, the ring. But I realized with, with the age that there is life after the ring, and you need to prepare for that. Absolutely. If you were going to give somebody advice on finding fulfillment, since we're talking outside of the ring, where do you feel like the secret to fulfillment lies? <clears throat> um, you want to do something, give it a shot. You want to, you think, you think like, oh, I want to move to the other side of the country. Try it. Yeah. Do what you want to do. Do what your heart wants to do. And, and don't be afraid of failing. Because a failure is only a failure if you give up after that. You can fail, but then it can, it can, it doesn't, it can seem like a failure in the short term. But then if that failure channels you to do something else and it becomes a success, that was a step to your success. It wasn't a failure. The failure is only become a failure when it's the last thing and it's the end of the road. If you that's what you do and that's it, and you just quit everything else, then you fail. But if that, um, you know, not positive or something that not undesirable result turns out, but it, it channels you to another road that becomes a desirable and, and a, a, you achieve a goal. It was a step in the in the goal, you know. They, they feel like failing a failing a, a three hundred pound bench press only is a failure if you don't ever try that weight again. But if you because you you failed it, you go back and you start doing negative reps. You start working a way to get stronger. Maybe do 
not just the bench press, you do some incline. You do other push exercises that strengthen the overall ligaments and everything else. And then you come back and you can push 400. That failure, that the, the day that you didn't do 300 was a step in going to 400, I believe. Well, I think that that's, you know, some profound information and, and you've embodied that with the way that you've lived life. I mean, like you, you found martial arts out of a necessity of a need to protect yourself. And then, you know, it grew into competition because once again, you wanted to push yourself and test yourself and it turned into a career simply because you kept seeing the next big challenge in your life. And then you met those challenges and then you had complete closure, which I think gives you a lot of expertise on finding fulfillment and balance in your life because you achieved everything that you were out to achieve and now you're passing that on forward and and i well, definitely you know what, do you know, what, you know what martial arts has actually done for me is it's led me to my ultimate goal in life that i believe i was put on this earth to do is to help people you know, if you know that I've done a lot of missions up north with the victims of the, the nuclear, uh, the triple triple disaster, earthquake, tsunami, nuclear. Yeah. Um, we still go to the, do bring stuff to the kids and the people up there. You know, the bracelets, I believe, are, are thing, another way to help people. I formed a group called Koi, Keep Our Island Safe in Hawaii, crimes picking up. And, you know, it's it's come to a point where we need people to, you know, to help people to stay safe you know even if we go to those shopping centers and escort elderly people to their cars you know i believe because of my fame in martial arts i'm able to do this no one would even give some dude making braces a chance the reason why they they buy mine is because they believe the the, the spirit of the maker goes into this bracelet and because i was who i was in fighting people are intrigued to have my bracelet the, the Koi setup, you know, I got in touch with a lot of senior homes to do free seminars for them. Who's this Tom, Dick, and Harry trying to call? They'll be like, oh, no. But, oh, this is Ensign Inouye, this famous martial artist. His brother's a very famous martial artist, too. Oh, wow, okay, let's have him come in. You know, the North, when you went, we went up to the North to, to bring out supplies to people, they, they turn people away. You can't, no, you, you, you got to go through association. But because I was who I was and they found out who I was, like Ensign Inouye, you can do it you know so martial arts i think it was a stepping stone to to my true calling of being able to help people and i believe that's where i'm at right now is that's what martial arts has brought me not just the stability and the, the security of being comfortable with who i am and what i've done but it's also brought me to my what i believe right now is my real calling is to help people Absolutely. I mean, and you've always embodied that because you were always kind of the representation of, you know, the the samurai warrior mindset. I mean, I can just remember watching you in fights and just your, your demeanor and your energy and it would switch, you know, because it was always this cool, calm, you know, patient. And then the bell would ring and like this whole other person would come out and then it would be over, you know, and you were always very respectful and you always carried yourself really well as a martial artist and it really shone through, you know, and it had to shine through on copied VHS tapes, but you know, you really <laughs> influenced, uh, you know, me and, and I know you've influenced millions of people because in those days, especially it was martial artists that were seeking to test themselves. Like you had mentioned, it wasn't about, Oh, I can do that to become famous. It was like, if you want the ultimate test of yourself with a physical combat altercation type thing, like, you know, you were one of those leaders that, was doing that in a way that gave us something to look up to. And, and it's definitely been a shining light that I feel that a lot of people respect and appreciate. Um, you know, George Sotteropoulos is a friend and all he talks about is, you know, when he <laughs> ran into you and he, you know, you moved him to Japan with you for like a year to train. And, um, but he always talked about how big your heart was and how hard you had hit him, but he really spoke to, you know, your, uh, your heart and who you were as a person. And, and he really admires you and, and just, and being close with George, like, I know what that means coming from him and uh, you definitely have had that influence on me and other people in the world. And we're definitely glad you chose to, to stay in Japan and, and go fight for, for this guy to test yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one more thing to this real, real interesting about my life in Japan, I, because I stayed in Japan, I am who I am and I have what I have. 
And I still remember back in the day, you know, I moved to Japan by myself. Mm -hmm. A kid that would, would jump in the water every day, surf or dive or swim in the ocean every day. I couldn't get away from the ocean. I love great jiu-jitsu. I couldn't get away from great jiu-jitsu. And I made this move up here to stay up here by myself. And I, I remember, still remember, and it gives me a little bit of a real wheezy feeling in my chest, remembering those three times or four times that I literally was homesick, had no money. Everything wasn't going well, you know, especially, you know, when something goes bad where I get scoldings from the, the president of the English school saying that oh, I got complaints about my teaching and, you know, things go bad. That's when the, the, the homesick and the sadness hit you even harder. There were three or four times in my life here in Japan that I really thought of going home, throwing in the towel and just going home. I mean, just close. I mean, as close as picking up a phone and saying, Mom, I'm coming home. And it scares me to think that I threw all of this away. And, and you know, I mean, it's a good thing for people to know that, you know, you never know. You never know what's going to happen. Don't give up, man. Go and, and re use your resources as far as you can. And only stop when you have to. And it's not a choice. You shouldn't be able to give up. You shouldn't give up. So I just want to point that out that, man, I mean, if I die tomorrow, I don't have any complaints of my life. I, w I do want to live a little further. Of course, there's more things I want to do. I mean, I have my, mm -hmm. my girl now that, you know, that I want to do more things with. So there's a lot of things I want to do. But if, if it, it came to where I had to die tomorrow, I wouldn't have any regrets. And that's a really good feeling. Yeah. And that's a beautiful perspective to have on life that, you know, more people need to be able to have that perspective if you know finding that fulfillment understanding what really matters in life and and finding yourself you know like you're saying it is it's knowing what you are trying to achieve and growing as an individual until you're able to invest in others and that's where you kind of find this this fulfillment circle is growing and helping others and you've definitely done it you're the embodiment of the the warrior in my eyes and many others and i appreciate you taking some time um i definitely will be in touch and and, and we'll talk soon all right. Take it easy and good talking to you, man.